But I think what is important to note that by broadening the criteria for anorexia nervosa ever so slightly, by dropping the frequency, by reducing the frequency criteria for bulimia nervosa from where it is now to half of that, and by recognizing binge eating disorder as its own freestanding, if you like, eating disorder, uh, the idea, of course, would be then to pull a whole number of folks who would currently get a diagnosis of EDNOS into these three categories, leaving the pool of EDNOS uh, patients uh, somewhat smaller. And the reason why that that is so is currently in the clinical studies that we have available, uh, one from our own group shows that as many as 60% of people who present for treatment currently get a diagnosis of EDNOS. And that's very different from other areas of psychiatry where uh, NOS, not otherwise specified, would be sort of a residual diagnostic category for um, those who don't meet full criteria for, say, mood disorder or anxiety disorder. Yet in eating disorders, so there's a smaller group of patients. Yet in eating disorders, up until now at least, it's been the majority of our patients. And that somehow doesn't make clinical sense. It's too uh, heterogeneous a group. It, we don't know what to do uh, treatment wise. There are no studies specifically geared towards ED and OS. So it just doesn't make good clinical and research sense. So the idea of just broadening the, the criteria for the eating disorders ever so slightly, you would be able to get a more equitable spread, if you like, within uh, our clinical population. Well, a lot of the media attention has been on binge eating disorder being moved into the eating disorder category. Can you talk a little bit about it? Is it a, is it a new classification, or what are some of the, the characteristics? Uh, it's not that new. Well, if you can call it 10 or 15 years, not that new. Uh, a bit longer than that. Uh, binge eating disorder was... Um, put forward as an example of an eating disorder not otherwise specified at the time that DSM-4 was put together, so in 1994. Um, and so for the last 16 years, it has been treated as sort of a separate uh, diagnostic entity, which was the intention, I think, of the DSM-4. Um, from a research and clinical perspective, so several studies have come to the fore front uh, during this time then, specifically looking at treatments for binge eating disorder as a separate diagnostic entity. And I think by establishing uh, research and clinical work around this diagnostic entity, uh, I think a lot of folks have also been able to demonstrate that it is indeed uh, a separate syndrome, uh, although of course all eating disorders are related in, in significant ways, but a separate syndrome nevertheless from other EDNOS patients or from AN anorexia nervosa or BN bulimia nervosa. Um, and I think that's going to be put forward then in DSM-5 as a, a separate uh, diagnosis. So it's been around for at least the last two decades, but formally recognized since 1994. Can you talk a little bit, a little bit about what it is, what it looks like? Um, so binge eating disorder is kind of what it it is what it says it is. Uh, it says a disorder of binge eating. Um, so unlike patients with anorexia nervosa who might also engage in binge eating episodes, uh, that it's usually is defined by someone with anorexia as having one bite more than they wanted to have. So it could be a bite of a bagel or an apple. But because the food, uh, the intake expectations for someone with anorexia nervosa are so stringent that if you just transgress ever so slightly, uh, those patients would refer to that as a binge. But it might not be an objectively large episode of, of eating, but nevertheless is is felt, is experienced by the the patient as a binge. Um, and for bilimin for bilimin of also, uh, a, a hallmark characteristic of the disorder is binge eating. But binge eating followed by compensatory behaviors to rid yourself of the calories that you think you should not have consumed. So once you've had a binge, uh, you would engage in either self-induced vomiting or uh, laxative abuse or excessive exercising or periods of, of extreme starvation to compensate for the binge eating episode. Um, and then when you get to binge eating disorder, um, the Disorder presents more frequently among adults than, than it does among adolescents, although that is 
somewhat controversial, but at least for now, 95% of the studies would, uh, would have focused on adult populations. Um, the, the mean body weight would almost always be somewhat above average or even somewhat overweight. Uh, and the hallmark characteristic would be frequent binge eating episodes, like the case in bulimia nervosa, but not followed by compensatory behaviors, which in some ways explains why most of those patients would be overweight, because you would be giving in to frequent bouts of overeating. Uh, not that the compensatory behaviors that's a hallmark of bulimia nervosa manages or helps patients to control their weight, but those two go together in bulimia nervosa, but those two don't go together in, in binge eating disorder. And now it, it seems like the binge eating disorder is of sort of a different type from anorexia and bulimia in that it's more of a weight gain eating disorder than a weight loss. Uh, does this reflect any sort of philosophical shift in the field uh, to, to incorporate? Well, y y yes and no. Although a, a majority of patients with binge eating disorder would be on the heavier side, Whereas, of course, you can't get the diagnosis of anorexia nervosa unless you severely underweight. Uh, what, what all the, the patients who get a diagnosis of an eating disorder would be sharing uh, uh, are the, the psychological symptoms that are the hallmark of eating disorders. Overvaluation of thinness and um, wrapping your esteem uh, so much around your weight and shape uh, to the detriment of any other, or to the exclusion of any other aspect of who we are as people. Uh, so if you look at, at that psychological makeup of what's the drive behind uh, most of our patients, there would be a fair degree of similarity between what goes on in the mind of someone with anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. Uh, but the other aspects that might uh, come into play that um, kind of separate our patients out into these various diagnostic categories. But they certainly, if you have, uh, if you use a Venn diagram as a model and each of these disorders would be a Venn diagram, they might be separate, I feel like I'm putting up my hand here in front of the camera. They might be separate, they're, they're all separate circles, but they all overlap. It's just the degree to which they overlap. And so that psychological component about what is driving people to be that worried about their weight and shape, uh, that's pretty much a, a part of just about everyone with a diagnosis of an eating disorder.